Okay, Edwin, I think we can start. So welcome everybody. It is a, an honor and a pleasure to introduce the 2020 uh, Pierre de Viva Award Lecture, which this year is going to be presented by Fabio Roli. Let me tell you a little bit about the award. The, uh, it was uh, initiated in the year 2000 by TC1 to recognize seminal contributions to the field of statistical pattern recognition. And since then, there have been 10 winners. And traditionally, the winner presents their lecture at the joint S and SSPR uh, workshops. The award is, is named after Pierre de Viva, who um, was one of the pioneers of statistical pattern recognition. He was a former president of the IEPR. And with Joseph Kittler, he wrote the um, groundbreaking textbook, uh, Pattern Recognition, a Statistical Approach, which appeared in the, uh, the mid 1980s. So the award is, uh, is made by a committee of a former award winners uh, who make nominations and then vote on them. And this year, the unanimous agreement was that Fabio Roli should uh, receive the award. So let me, uh, let me read to you the citation. Uh, it's to uh, Professor Fabio Roli, the University of Cagliari. He's, he is awarded the 2020 Pierre de Viva Award for his seminal contributions to ensemble learning and multiple classifier systems and for his extended service to the IAPR TC1. So let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Fabio before he gives his lecture. Um, he is full professor of computer science at the University of Cagliari in Italy and director of the Pattern Recognition and Applications Laboratory there. He is also a partner and R&D manager of the company Pluribus One uh, that he co-founded. Fabio Roux's research over the past 30 years has addressed the design of pattern recognition systems in the context of real security applications. He has provided seminal contributions to the fields of multiple classifier systems and adversarial machine learning, and has played a leading role in the establishment and advancement of uh, this research theme. Professor Rowley is one of the pioneers in the use of pattern recognition and adversarial machine learning uh, for computer security. He has been the PI of dozens of R&D projects, including the leading European projects, uh, Cyber Road and ILL Buster on AI for computer security. His current age index is 70, according to Google Scholar. He has been uh, appointed Fellow of the IEEE and Fellow of the International Association of Pattern Recognition. He was a member of the NATO Advisory Panel for Information and Communication Security um, between uh, 2008 and 2011. So Fabio is very well known in our community and it is a pleasure to ask him to present the 2020 Pierre de Viva Award Lecture. Uh, Fabio. Uh, thank you. Thank you a lot to uh, Edwin for your kind introduction and really thank to all the organizer of this workshop on uh, statistical, syntactic and structural pattern recognition. Uh, it, it's indeed a, a great honor to me uh, to receive this award in memory of PR Deviver and to give this, this, this lecture. Uh, it, it's a great honor uh, because, uh, well, uh, I, I always considered uh, Pierre de Viver uh, a role model to me, uh, well, because uh, even if, uh, unfortunately, I had a few opportunities uh, to meet uh, Pierre in person, but reading his papers, uh, in particular the, 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 the famous book that you mentioned, Edwin, called to read with uh, Joseph Kittler on statistical pattern recognition, and also, well, uh, listening to what uh, Joseph Kittler and other colleagues of Pierre told me about uh, 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 him. Uh, well, I, I, I always realized that uh, Pierre de Viver was a really a great gentleman with a lot uh, of not only scientific interest, but also, well, social and cultural interest. So I always considered him a, 
role model, and I do believe that uh, uh, it can be a, a, a role model for, for many young scientists in our pattern recognition community. And as you said, Edwin, he was a great computer scientist, one of the fathers of statistical pattern recognition and a driving force. One, one of, of, of the founders of our association, the International Association uh, for Pattern Recognition. Uh, so it's indeed a great honor uh, for me to receive this award and to give this lecture. Well, uh, today my, my lecture, my talk, uh, is not a technical talk. Uh, sorry about that, but uh, in the end, uh, I decided uh, just to share with you a few reflections on my journey into pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my journey uh, started, uh, well, uh, a lot of years ago. Uh, in, uh, well, 1986. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, my, my starting period, uh, well, I, I like to, to refer to my starting period uh, as my known, known period. And uh, soon, uh, in a few slides, I will explain you why uh, I use this term for my, the beginning of my, of my journey. Well, at that time uh, in 1986, uh, well, I, I was a, a graduate student in electronic engineering, uh, and I was working on my thesis. Uh, by the way, I remember that uh, I was quite lucky with the choice uh, of my thesis because uh, in the town where I lived, uh, there was a company, a quite a large enterprise, uh, and they were developing uh, a knowledge-based computer vision system for sorting mechanical tools. That means that the project of that company was to create a prototype, a prototype of a robotic system equipped with a video camera <laughs> to collect images of mechanical tools over a conveyor belt to recognize the mechanical tools. And then uh, well, there was a, a robotic arm, a simple robotic arm to sort the mechanical tools. I'm speaking of mechanical tools like uh, Emmer's, uh, wrenches, pliers, uh, rings, and so on. And uh, at that time, uh, the company, uh, that company, they, 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 they had uh, the problem to automatize the creation of object models. Because while, while they experienced it, that the creation of object models of the mechanical tools manually was quite expensive uh, and uh, well time consuming uh, and also prone to errors. One important thing is that uh, at that time in the 80s, they were using the technology that uh, uh, was called uh, knowledge-based systems, also called expert systems. That means that uh, uh, while they needed to learn uh, symbolic models of the object classes, so while well, nothing to do with, nothing that you can do with neural networks or statistical learning, but uh, I, my goal, uh, what I had to do is to use uh, some symbolic learning algorithm to learn symbolic models of the objects to be exported to the knowledge base of the system. Well, well the goal was not so simple, but uh, well, my thesis advisor at that time, Professor Gianni Vernazza, well, uh, today is a, is a very good friend of mine, gave me a very good advice. He told me, Fabio, read, read very carefully uh, this book that is the reference book uh, for symbolic machine learning. And indeed, the book that you see uh, on the slide was uh, in the 80s, uh, uh, the reference book for machine learning. But uh, it contained uh, mainly symbolic machine learning algorithms, so nothing about neural networks or statistical learning, but uh, the main focus was on uh, 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 learning algorithms to create uh, symbolic models of cl data classes. And uh, it was a book edited by three leading people in the field, uh, Richard Michalski, uh, James Carbonell, and uh, Tom Mitchell. Well, by the way, it's a book that I recommend, is, even if it's, it's very old, what is a good reading also today? Well, I read uh, uh, for a few months the book, and in the end, uh, I selected uh, well, one algorithm for my job, for my thesis, for learning symbolic models of mechanical tools from images. 
And the algorithm was the induced algorithm by Richard Michalski. Oh, maybe you don't know if you are young, uh, who was uh, Michalski, who uh, was a, a Polish gentleman. Uh, if I remember well, then he, he was naturalized a uh, USA citizen. And he was one of the, the leading people uh, in machine learning in the 80s. And he invented this algorithm called Induce for, uh, for learning from examples and counterexamples, symbolic description of object classes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the algorithm used uh, a symbolic language that was basically the first order predicate logic. Mm -hmm. And the algorithm was uh, quite simple. Uh, if you want to learn uh, uh, the symbolic description of one class, uh, you can start from just one example of the class, call it the seed. All the other example of the other classes are considered counterexample. And what Induce does is a sort of guided heuristic search for discovering this symbolic description that uh, are satisfied uh, by all the example of the given class and don't satisfy all the other counterexample. This was basically the operation of this algorithm. I decided uh, to use this algorithm. Uh, well, you should note, we should note uh, uh, that uh, while this algorithm was uh, well, a popular algorithm in the 80s, but was originally designed to learn a symbolic description of very simple uh, data classes. Uh, you find, you see on the slide, uh, the examples of the two data classes, which uh, were the original benchmark data set for the induced algorithm. Two classes of object of toy trains, of toy trains, not real ones, not real trains. One class, the trains going to east, and the other class, the trains going to the opposite direction. It's quite easy to immediately see that uh, at that time, this algorithm was dealing with uh, noise free data. Yeah? Everything was perfectly known and predictable. And this is the reason why I call this type of machine learning, learning of known knowns. And uh, while I refer to this initial period of my career uh, as my known knowns uh, period, because I started with this kind of machine learning. Mm -hmm. You see, while on the slide, the type of this symbolic description that Induce was able to learn, eh? simple, Simple, but because of well, the toy trains, the, the, the samples, the objects that you are considering are quite simple. So, well, uh, I coded this algorithm. Uh, I remember that uh, I used uh, the Lisp language for coding the induced algorithm, and I used uh, some Fortran language for the image processing part. And then uh, I applied the, the, the algorithm to, to my real to my real data. And uh, well, what uh, I experienced, uh, I should confess that uh, uh, I realized that uh, I, did, I, I, I did a, a mistake because uh, while well, I used a learning algorithm for no knowns, but I applied the result uh, to a situation, to a, a scenario, a data set that I call, that I call known unknowns. Why? Because my final goal was, to learn uh, symbolic models of mechanical tools from real images, from a real video camera. And so of course, my data, they were affected by some noise. So in the end, uh, well, my result, uh, my, my result was that uh, the object models learned under the assumption of the induced algorithm of that I call known knowns, they were very simple. Easy to understand, quite easy to understand. You can see here one of the results of the first paper that I published, but uh, they exhibited a, really and honestly a poor generalization capability. Why? Because uh, they, they, they were not able to deal with the noise affecting the data. And uh, well, another thing uh, in retrospective, that uh, I realized now well, while I was preparing this lecture and I was reading again my first paper based on the results of my master thesis. 
I realized that uh, at the beginning of my scientific career, I was a strong believer in the low or small number. That means that, uh, well, shame to me, while my first paper results, they were obtained with a test set of only 15 images of mechanical tools, just 15, one five, because I, I, I had five classes of mechanical tools and three examples per class in my, in my test set. So I should confess that I, I was a strong believer in the low small number, but I, I'm, after, many years, uh, a friend of mine, Marcello Pellillo, explained to me that uh, I was not the only one. I was in, in a very good company because uh, these two uh, gentlemen, two famous economists, uh, that they did seminal work on behavioral economics, uh, they explained that uh, very often people, ordinary people, but also scientists, uh, uh, they are strong believer in the low or small numbers. That means that they do their experiments using a very small data set, and then they believe that the result can be applied also to large data set uh, for the real world applications. Well, after this uh, kickoff uh, with uh, known knowns, uh, I moved uh, immediately to what I call my known unknowns period. That, uh, well, I should say means that uh, I became uh, well, uh, a, uh, a fan of this gentleman, Thomas Bayes. That means that I studied very seriously uh, Bayes theory, probability theory, decision risk, uh, uh, and all the stuff that is necessary to deal with noisy data. And so the, the, the next uh, five years, uh, well, I remember that, uh, yeah, I, I published a good number of journal papers. Hmm? Uh, well, what, I, what I, in retrospective I noted uh, reading again my papers is that uh, I also did some work uh, on the topic of explainable AI, even if uh, at that time in the 90s, the name he used uh, was completely different. Uh, the name was, uh, uh, the issue of transparency uh, in, uh, in, in AI. Uh, and, uh, but, but the essence uh, was exactly the same like today, trying to, to provide some explanation uh, for the operation of neural networks, especially neural networks at that time. Well, in retrospective, uh, well, I, uh, I must be honest, uh, was more than enough to get my PhD and a subsequent assistant professor position but uh, now that I read again my papers at that time, well, not, nothing really memorable. That I, means that, uh, well, honestly, I think that uh, the most of these papers are, are, well, is, is, are already lost. Hmm? Are already lost like tears in the rain. Yeah. Like, uh, after that, uh, I jumped into another period of my journey that I call my multiple classifier period. Uh, was a quite longer period, you know, well, around 15 years. Uh, it started uh, with a, a research question that uh, was uh, quite popular at that time. Uh, why combining multiple classifiers? That can appear a, uh, 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 well, a trivial question, but especially because uh, if you can solve the task uh, using only one classifier, why should you use more than one? But uh, at the time uh, was quite evident, but already at the real beginning, uh, uh, I do believe of pattern recognition. If you read this, the Bible, one of the Bibles of pattern recognition, the uh, Do Die and Dart book, uh, it's pretty much clear that uh, in pattern classification, uh, well, the key issue are the features, the feature that you use. If you are good enough that uh, you can, you discover, you, you can use invariant features because you have a good model, for instance, of the problem that you, have, you want to, uh, to deal with, uh, well, classifier is not so important. And this is something that uh, reading again, the Duda Art book, the Duda and Art book uh, is quite clear, of course, yeah? But the point uh, in the 80s and also in the 90s was that uh, manual feature engineering was not very effective. We know very well now, especially when we compare manual feature engineering with, uh, with uh, uh, 
deep learning, yeah, deep learning feature extraction. And so uh, to me, but also to many people in our community, in the recognition community, the combination of multiple classifier appeared to be a practical solution to exploit multiple design of the imperfect classifier uh, based on, let's say, poor of modest uh, features. And so while for a good number of years, I worked on multiple classifier, uh, one thing that I remember with pleasure is that uh, I organized a long series of workshops called MCS, Multiple Classifier System Workshop. Uh, and I had a lot of fun. Well, I organized uh, this workshop series with uh, my friend and distinguished colleague at the University of Surrey, Joseph Kittler who helped me a lot uh, with this workshop series. And not only, uh, it was really instrumental to, to well, a good part of my, of my work and, and career. And together, together with Joseph, uh, we started up uh, uh, in the year 2000, this workshop series. And for a long time, uh, well, the workshop uh, went on uh, with, with a good success. Well, the, the main thing that I remember that uh, we was able to create a community, a community inside the larger community of uh, IAPR, uh, well focused uh, on, on, the, on the topic of uh, uh, multiple classifier system. And uh, well, in retrospect, it, the, the other thing that I remember with, with, with a great pleasure was that uh, along this part of my journey, I met uh, my best uh, fellow, fellow travelers, my students, my students. Uh, well, the picture that, uh, the photo that, that you see has been taken, well, some years ago. I don't remember exactly how many, but some years ago. Uh, some of my students now are distinguished colleagues, uh, but it well, it's, uh, was a great time, yeah? Uh, was a great time working on multiple classifier system with them and not only. So well, th th this talk is also a small tribute uh, to my student. Well, uh, after this uh, 15 years journey uh, on multiple classifiers, uh, while I was preparing uh, this lecture, I reflected about, uh, well, that after the, this long journey, well, we, we realize it, not, not only me and my co-authors, my, my students, but I, I believe a whole the community working on the topic that uh, while the initial big questions, hmm, what is the best ensemble of classifier? What is the best combiner? Error diversity is good. Uh, well, no way, well, let's say to find a well-posed solution, to well-posed answer to this question. And the reason is that, uh, well, this uh, big uh, question, uh, and th this question, they were always uh, uh, present uh, in, in all the abstract uh, of all the paper on multiple classifier system. All this question, they were, well, quite ill posed in retrospective and, uh, well, in some sense, almost unsolvable. For example, error diversity was for a long time in the community, well, sort of holy gray. Uh, a lot of paper published uh, claiming that uh, I have a new error diversity measure, I can create uh, an ensemble of classifier making different errors so that the combination is good, is very good, much better than the performances of the individual classifier. But in the end, we realized that as a community that error diversity was a, a too much elusive concept uh, and was uh, impossible to, fi to find an error diversity measure that uh, uh, was very well correlated with the performances uh, of an ensemble of classifier. Mm. And also the other two big question, what is the best ensemble, the best combiner? They were uh, uh, quite ill posed. But on the other side, on the other side, in retrospective, uh, I think that uh, we found uh, a few solid achievements uh, uh, that are still useful, yeah? Uh, well, for instance, that uh, it's better to use simple combination methods uh, when you have limited data set can appear a little bit trivial, but it is a robust result. It is a robust achievement that averaging the outputs of multiple classifier is an aggressive 
variance reductor, you can reduce a lot of the variance of the test set error, uh, increasing the classifier ensemble size. Oh, well, these two results, this one and the other, well, they are results that honestly has been uh, discovered and rediscovered independently by many people, not only me and my colleagues. And the last result is, is a result that I like uh, because I work uh, uh, on security applications. Uh, and uh, well, uh, in security application, combination of multiple classifier is very useful, but suppose that uh, the combiner, the combiner that you use for the, uh, is able to well to produce a closed decision boundary so that you can close the boundary uh, uh, surrounding one of the classes uh, against the other classes. That is the typical security problem in, in pattern recognition. Well, so uh, a question that uh, well I thought about uh, preparing this uh, this. Uh, this lecture was okay. Well, I spent uh, a, lo a long time working on multiple classifiers, oh, long weekends and long hours. What remains of the old multiple classifier, good old multiple classifiers? Well, for sure, uh, today the topic of the combination of multiple classifiers, also called the ensemble learning in, machine lear uh, in the machine learning community, well, uh, is not more uh, well at the core of the mainstream uh, in the sense that uh, already some years ago, uh, the lady in this photo, Lucy Kuncheva, a very good friend of mine, who, by the way, uh, a leading person uh, of the field of multiple classifier field, uh, field uh, some years ago noted that the number of paper published on multiple classifiers uh, uh, was approaching zero. That, that means that, uh, uh, as we know, uh, there are other hot topics uh, in the mainstreams. And uh, for sure, uh, we forgot. I mean, we as a community of scientists, we forgot uh, the search for the ultimate causes uh, in the big question about best ensemble, best combiner, error diversity. But uh, I do believe, uh, looking at the literature, reading the literature, that uh, multiple classifiers are still alive. Mm -hmm. Are still alive because uh, in, oh, today they are people use a different name. They use the name. The popular name is deep ensembles, but they are still used uh, and uh, to improve the accuracy, the uncertainty, and very important, the robustness. Uh, for out of distribution sample, that, that is the big issue today. Yeah, when you, when uh, because often for real application, you get the samples very out of the distribution of the training set distribution. Uh, well, it's quite uh, well the community of working on security application is quite aware that the fusion combination of multiple classifier can increase the robustness against the adversarial example, against attacks to, against, to your pattern recognition system. And uh, well, I always like to see that many companies, uh, uh, I'm mentioning Amazon Web Service, but not, not, isn't the not, not, not the only one, many, many companies, when they speak about their pattern recognition production systems, so while well, application in the wild, they recommend uh, to remember the use of a classifier combination. Uh, so while well, they are still alive, I do believe, and this is good for me that I worked for a long time uh, uh, on, this, on this topic. Well, uh, well, one thing that I'd like to share with you is that, uh, uh, well, in the middle of my journey into pattern recognition was around the year 2000, I was, uh, what I, would say uh, a, mi uh, a small midlife crisis, hmm? uh, not a serious life crisis, ju just an intellectual one, because at a given time, I started to ask myself, uh, uh, what am I doing for a living? W what is my job? Yeah, I'm spending, well, long hours, uh, well, working on pattern recognition, but uh, what is pattern recognition? 
Well, my question was about uh, uh, if pattern recognition could be considered a science. And so uh, I, I, I could consider myself a scientist or was engineering. And so I should consider myself uh, while a person developing uh, new technologies. In the end, uh, what I was interested in that period was uh, the epistemology, the epistemology of, uh, of uh, pattern recognition. And so I spent some time uh, uh, thinking about the problem of this epistemology of pattern recognition. And what, what, what was quite uh, funny and stimulating, especially because I was uh, very lucky and uh, along uh, this part, uh, over this part of my journey, I found uh, some very good uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, one was Bob Dan and uh, that uh, they shared with me this passion for the epistemology of pattern recognition. Well, with Bob Dunn, we had a lot of fun discussing around the epistemology of pattern recognition. Oh, we, we, we had, uh, uh, I remember, opposite views because Bob was uh, much more in favor of considering pattern recognition as a science. Uh, while my view was always that pattern recognition is engineering, but simply because I consider engineering a science, the science of the artificial systems, yeah, uh, according to the view of Herbert Simon. But in the end, with Bob, we found a compromise uh, between our two opposite views, and we wrote uh, a paper on pattern recognition letters. Uh, another fellow travelers. Tra fellow travelers in this sort of search for the epistemology was my friend and colleague, distinguished colleague, Marcello Calillo. Well, I, I should say that I, I learned a lot of things about the epistemology and the philosophical issues of pattern recognition, speaking with Marcello, uh, because Marcello is a great computer scientist, but he is also, well, let's say a semi-professional philosopher. And so well, we had a lot of fun discussing around the philosophical aspects of pattern recognition. And uh, well, uh, then I moved, I moved to, to, to the last uh, period of this journey. I, I do hope not, not the last one, but uh, well, the last period that I'm telling you in this lecture, what, what I call my unknown, unknowns period. And soon in a few slides, I explain you why I call this period of my journey uh, and my career, of course, my unknown unknowns period. Over this part uh, of my journey, uh, I live at uh, uh, what I think uh, all of us uh, as a community live at. And uh, I mean, uh, the rise of benchmark data set in pattern recognition in machine learning larger and larger data set uh, year after year. And so, well, if I look in retrospective at the beginning of my career, you could publish without any problem a paper, even if uh, you didn't test your algorithm against benchmark data set. But along over my journey, benchmark data set, they became a must. And uh, in my view, this was uh, on one side, uh, positive, beneficial, especially for some uh, uh, particular applications of, um, of pattern recognition, like optical character recognition. I am not an expert of optical character recognition, but reading li the literature, uh, well, my opinion is that uh, the use of a larger and larger benchmark data set uh, was beneficial for the progress of optical pattern recognition. But on the other side, I do believe uh, 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 and well, it's quite clear from the state of the art that at the given time, our community uh, realized something uh, that uh, is quite well known in science in general. I mean, that the map is not the territory. Mm -hmm. uh, this could became, uh, well, in my opinion, quite clear when people in our community uh, and in the community in particular of computer vision, they started to raise the question, but uh, are benchmark data sets representative of real world problem? That means, okay, fellow, we, we use benchmark data set uh, 
uh, as a must uh, to publish any academic paper, yeah? But uh, the benchmark data set that we use are representative of the real world problem that uh, we claim in our academic papers we are solving. And uh, well, a few guys in, in the computer vision community, uh, they address this, uh, this issue and uh, well, when they address the, the issue asking what is the value of current benchmark data set when used to train algorithms for object recognition in the real world, probably you know that the answer that, that emerged in the community was that uh, benchmark data set are better than nothing, but not by much. Hmm? Why? Because, uh, well, the community of pattern recognition and computer vision realized something that uh, I do believe we all knew and know very well. And so that uh, what we are doing in the most of cases is learning from data and we learn statistical correlations. But unfortunately, many of the benchmark data set that we use contain some biases, huh? Huh? some biases. And this means that uh, when you use uh, a benchmark data set uh, for training and you test uh, your algorithm, pattern recognition algorithm, uh, for, on a test set from the same database, well, the accuracy can be good. But when you test well, your algorithm against another, a different uh, benchmark data set, uh, you often experience a drop of accuracy. That is due to the biases because uh, while specific data set, they contain specific biases. Well, for instance, you want to recognize cars and you use a, a database containing cars. But often, if you analyze carefully the database, you note that uh, maybe the most of car images are frontal views. And so of course you have a bias. Hmm? And this was a, a, a common problem that uh, has been realized in our, in our community. On the other hand, well, we should say that, uh, well, over my, I, I should say that over my journey, uh, I have seen uh, a, a tremendous progress of pattern recognition. And today, something that was, uh, uh, well, unthinkable uh, at the beginning of my career, for some specific task, like uh, image classification, well, we have pattern recognition algorithm based on deep learning that provide performances better than humans. Mm? For, of course, for specific tasks using a specific benchmark data set, but this is what uh, I consider the bright side of pattern recognition. But on the, other, on the other side, over my journey, I became interested to this question. The high accuracy is high robustness of our pattern recognition algorithm. Consider this a uh, simple picture. Yeah? You have uh, two set of samples, yeah? and you see this point is blue, this is red. If I ask you, is this point blue or red? Well, I think that uh, you immediately uh, answer me is blue. And what you are doing, you are using a, a very well-known assumption in machine learning and pattern recognition, that statistical pattern recognition, that is called the smoothness assumption. That tells you that the points, samples close to each other are more likely to share uh, the same label. This is something that uh, is very commonly uh, assumed. But uh, if the smoothness assumption is true, if you believe in the smooth, smoothness assumption, if I show you these two pictures, two photos, and I ask you, how a deep net should classify these two images? If you look at the two images, they look exactly the same. There is no difference. And so if I ask you if uh, oh, they should be classified by a deep network uh, with the same of a different classification label, of course, you tell me the same, of course, according to the smoothness assumption, according to the common sense, given that they look very similar. But uh, many recent work over the last recent, 
many works over the last uh, 10 years uh, showed results about uh, what I call adversarial patterns. In machine learning people, they prefer the word, uh, the term uh, adversarial examples. That means that uh, solving a quite simple constrained optimization problem that you can solve using basically some modification of gradient descent, you can take this image and to discover that there is a, a small perturbation that you can apply to each pixel of the given image so that the resulting image, this image, huh, looks exactly the same for us, but uh, while well, for deep neural networks, and not only for deep neural networks, but uh, you can find this result for all the classifier that you want, well, the classification is completely wrong. In this case, it's an animal, but you can decide which classification you want. Yeah, you can fool uh, the, the, the pattern recognition system as you want. Uh, this is quite an ex well established result. And this is what uh, I call uh, I unknown unknowns in pattern recognition. And this is the reason why I call this period of my journey, of my career, my unknown unknowns period. That means that uh, today in pattern recognition, it can happen that uh, in your training set, you have uh, some regions, some parts of your sp feature space, which exhibit uh, P of X, the probability of having a pattern, a sample close to zero. And so according to the Bayes theory, you should disregard, yeah? that part of your feature space because P of X is zero. So there is no risk. But today we know that uh, someone, let's say a malicious guy can take this sample and to find a, 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 a malicious perturbation so that uh, this sample is changing to this sample that is called an adversarial example, an adversarial pattern and is completely misclassified. This is what I call a blind spot for pattern recognition system. That is an example of unknown unknowns, what I call unknown unknowns. Oh, another reason for unknown unknowns uh, is that, uh, well, deep neural networks that we use in pattern recognition so often, now, uh, while well, many results prove it, that uh, deep neural networks uh, can be very unstable. Uh, and instability means that, uh, look at these images. You, you, you can have two images of two cars that they look exactly the same and this image of the dog. But uh, while in the image space, in the image space, while the three images are very far each other, they, they, they looks very different. But, uh, using the technique of adversarial machine learning of the creation of adversarial example that I have uh, shown you before, you can take this sample and perturbate, uh, uh, manipulate the sample so that in the output space of the deep neural network, uh, well, this sample is very close to the sample representing the dog so that the car can be misclassified as a dog. Hmm? One important question is, uh, uh, well, is why pattern recognition and the learning system used inside pattern recognition system are so vulnerable? Well, researchers, they provided many answers. Let me give you only two, only two that I like. One is that, uh, well, the pattern recognition system that we use, they are based on learning system that they privilege learning of decision function which exhibit a large gradient. This is good for learning because if you have a large gradient, learning is very fast. We know very well that. But unfortunately, if in the end, the function that you have learned uh, is a function G of X with a large gradient, it's clear that small changes, small changes of uh, the input data can cause uh, a complete change of the classification output. And this is one of the reasons behind adversarial example and behind 
uh, the vulnerability of pattern recognition system, the large sensitivity due to the large gradient, especially in very high dimensional dimensionality. Another reason is uh, spurious features. What is spurious feature? Spurious feature is that uh, we should remember that in the end, uh, our learning systems are learning statistical correlations between the input data and the classification labels. And uh, well, a famous example is that uh, if I ask you, consider this picture of this wolf, ASCII, if uh, your input feature are pixels, if I ask you if the, which pixels are more correlated, correlated with the label, uh, the right label, wolf, you could discover, not always, but for many data sets, you could discover that, uh, well, these white pixels, there's no, are the most correlated. And this is, of course, due to the fact that you have some biases in your data set. And so what you are learning are spurious feature. Hmm? Spurious feature is something that a statistician, they know very well, and uh, is something that you cannot avoid. Hmm? And adversarial examples, uh, are really related to the concept of spurious feature because it's clear that, that uh, if I discover that your pattern recognition system is classifying this feature as a wolf just because there is a, a, back, a white background is enough that I add some back, white background so that uh, you classify everything as a wolf. Hmm? Well, th 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 this was my uh, 34 years journey, yeah, quite long in retrospective. And let me conclude uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, sharing with you a few reflections about uh, the next journey. Uh, I, I'm not speaking of my journey, well, I do hope, but I, I don't know if I have enough time for another 34 years journey, but I, I try to speak, uh, or to share with you some reflection about the next journey of all of us as a community of researchers in pattern recognition. One thing that I think, I think uh, is very useful for uh, as a next uh, step in our roadmap, research roadmap, is that uh, I do believe that we should spend uh, more time trying to make the society more aware of the limitation of modern AI, so modern pattern recognition. We are lucky today, pattern recognition uh, is the, top application, so it's very good. Uh, while making the society aware of the limitation is not an easy job because uh, we, should, we should try to be simple and clear. We cannot say ordinary people and the society that, uh, sorry, but the problem is the high idea assumption. And so sometimes our system, they don't work, but the fault uh, is, uh, uh, is fault of the high idea assumption. We should make an effort, a joint effort, uh, uh, to find uh, a way to explain to the society in a clear way which are the limitations. Mm -hmm. And uh, while we should avoid to scare people with, uh, let's say, uh, uh, malicious AI that could conquer the world uh, or adversarial examples, so you should be afraid that uh, the video camera on board of your car could classify the, the road sign uh, as a camel, yeah? Uh, because, uh, well, the story is much more complicated and we should be careful to, to scare people mm, with some particular results. Another thing that I do believe is that we should spend as a community in pattern recognition more time to be unifier and not only diversifiers. Mm, I'm using the terminology of a famous physicist, Freeman Dyson. Because well, uh, today, if you read papers on archive, uh, it's a very good thing. I like to read papers on archive, but uh, every day there is a new paper, a new algorithm, a new version of the new algorithm, and day after day, this is the story. I think that we should spend, especially young people, I know that it's difficult because you have to publish or perish, but uh, we should try to promote uh, for young people, uh, well, research work, uh, uh, Different, a different style, well, more work about umbrella studies, unification studies. J just to give you one example, we should try to unify adversarial example within a, a, a larger perspective. 
yesterday, one of the speaker, Nicolas Carlini, well, mm, well did, did a good point uh, explaining us that, uh, well, adversarial example is one side of the coin and the other side, probably the larger perspective is distribution shifts. Finally, I do believe that we should go, go beyond learning of statistical correlation that unfortunately are often spurious by, by definition in, in some cases. I know that is a big challenge. I know that uh, today we have something that works uh, and we cannot trash something that works, uh, dreaming for a new paradigm of data recognition. But I, I want to share with you a few promising research directions that I see to go beyond learning of statistical correlation. One is the work that in Italy, a team led by Marco Gori is doing, that is an attempt to incorporate inside deep learning some knowledge of the physical world, yeah? like the temporal coherence of, uh, well, the information about the context, spatial and temporal context. I do believe that is, this is a promising research direction. Also to reduce uh, the number, the huge number of training data that we need uh, to train modern deep learning system. Another, another promising research direction that I see is causal learning. I think that causal learning is a good way uh, to limit uh, uh, spurious feature. And finally, uh, I like a, a research direction that is called invariant risk minimization that uh, I think is a good way to learn uh, invariant features, which are much more robust against uh, distribution shift. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Thanks a lot for listening. So thank you very much, Fabio, for an intriguing talk. Um, while everybody is getting their microphones taken off mute so they can ask some questions, I'd just like to get the ball rolling by asking you the following. So you talked about your periods in, in your research career. And famously, Picasso had a, a blue period when he painted pictures which were predominantly blue or green between 1901 and 1904. And this, uh, this period uh, corresponded not just to him painting blue pictures, but he also had a blue mood. He was depressed during this time. Ah. So I'm not going to ask you about during which of your period you were depressed. I'm going to ask you what is your contra blue period? When have you been happiest um, in your research following these different paradigms? Oh, great, great question. Th th thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Yeah, of course. Well, yes. And thank you for comparing me with Picasso. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, uh, I do believe that if I look in retrospective, I think that uh, I was very happy during my what I call my multiple classifier period, because what was, was an exciting period, not only for the scientific result, but uh, because as I told, uh, uh, I had uh, the feeling to create uh, a new community. And this is something that is good, uh, I believe, in science, because I do believe that uh, science is a social phenomenon. Yeah? And so while uh, creating new community is, is very positive. And uh, then I should say that even if this last period that I call unknown unknowns can uh, appear so let's say a more blue period or a, well, a more depressing period. Well, I believe that is again another exciting period because I do believe that we have a chance uh, to move uh, uh, probably in, uh, well, 10 years, I don't know, but uh, well, to, to move to another paradigm, yeah, to another paradigm. And, and, uh, and, uh, and it's an exciting, exciting period to me because I think that uh, we as scientists, we can pay, play a role uh, to make the society more aware about uh, the real status of our pattern recognition technology. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, i now throwing the floor open to um, more questions for Fabio. Hi, uh, I think I have a question. So 
Uh, do you have any suggestions for young people who just start their academic career in pattern recognition? Well, good. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, as I told uh, in one of my last slide, uh, I think that uh, well, what, what I what, what I say to to my uh, PhD student is that uh, of course we cannot forget uh, the rules of the games. Yeah? We live in this world and uh, we should be aware of the rules of the game. So, and the rule is uh, often uh, publish or perish. But, uh, well, and so you have to publish, but uh, well, my recommendation and my suggestion is that if you want to create a good career, we should also find time uh, and spend some time to do some, uh, I call them umbrella studies. So try to be, to do some studies when you should not do the next version of the next algorithm, but to spend time reading papers and trying to find which are the commonalities and trying to find uh, if you can unify some perspective. I think that not probably in the very short, but in the medium and in the long term, this is a very good suggestion for young students. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so if there, if there are no more questions to Fabio, I'd like to thank him again for giving a comprehensive and fascinating uh, Pierre de Viva Award lecture and um, uh, look forward to meeting him in the future in some uh, non-virtual real conferences again. Thank you very much, Fabio. Thank you, Edwin. I hope so. I hope so very soon to meet you again face to face. Okay. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. And thank you again to everybody. Thank you very much. Bye bye and thank you. And let's hope we can all, all meet together again and socialize a bit. With that, the conferences are coming. Ho hopefully, they we'll be able to see each other and and spend some time together. Thank you, Andrea, and all the organizers for the great work. Thank you.